It's so nice to see you all. I am Dave Carger from Turner Classic Movies, and what a pleasure it is for me to be here with Julia Quinn, the author of the Bridgerton series, Diana Galbadone, the author of the Outlander series. Welcome to both of you. Thank you very much. <laughs> we could call this panel romantic fiction royalty. I, that's who I feel like I'm sitting here with, so it, it's an honor. I feel like this might be the first time the two of you have met each other? Have, oh, no, 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 we've have, met before. Oh, you yeah. have. But we haven't yeah. seen each other for it's a million years. It's been a long time. Oh, it's been a I while. I think it was in British Columbia, but yeah, yeah, yeah quite a long it's been a while ago. <laughs> wow. <laughs> One thing that the two of you have in common, if I was doing the math correctly, is that it was about a 20 year space of time in both of your cases, roughly, mm -hmm. between the publication of the first novel in the series, Bridgerton or Outlander, and the debut of the television series. Mm -hmm. I'm curious to hear from both of you, Julia, we'll start with you. How soon in the process of writing Bridgerton or the release of the first Bridgerton uh, novel, how soon did you start thinking about the possibility of this being shot for TV or film? Uh, never. Really? Never. I, I think my experience was different from yours because you, if I remember correctly, you had a lot of interest and it wasn't either panning out or it wasn't how you conceived yeah. it. Well, uh, somebody told me early on that of all the books published in a given year, approximately 1% are optioned for their film rights. Oh. An option means that they will give you a certain amount of money for a period of time during which they have the exclusive right to try to develop and get enough money to actually make a movie. They said of that 1%, one one hundredth of a percent actually gets made into a movie, you know, so don't hold your breath. And that's about how it worked out. Uh, Outlander was optioned five times before uh, Ron Moore finally made it work. <laughs> yeah, so for me it was very, very different. Um, it never occurred to me at all that it would get made because nothing in my genre ever gets made. Uh, Diana's book was the closest, but it's not really quite a romance. It has a wonderful romance in it, and it's hugely beloved among romance fans, but it's it's, it's a bigger scope, it's a different type of book. Right. Um, and she certainly paved the way, but nothing like what I do ever gets made. Um, the closest would be you know, the 47th Jane Austen adaptation, which <laughs> I, I, I'm there for. I'm there for every Jane Austen adaptation, but um, I think in Hollywood, people really thought, well, if you wanna do a period romantic piece, you do Jane Austen, one of the Brontes, and you're instantly mm -hmm. you know, highbrow. And so it never ever occurred to me that somebody would option it, and when I, got the call, it was completely out of the blue. We hadn't been shopping it around. I just got really lucky and I found out later that um, Shonda Rhimes had been working in, I, I think she said it was in London actually, and she's a very avid reader and she mm. always brings books to read when she goes on vacation and she didn't bring enough books. And somehow my book, The Duke and I, just happened to be there and she picked it up. Wow. And that's what happened. God, just takes one person sometimes, right? It's the right person. Avenged. The right person, yes. <laughs> right, exactly. And, you know, I'm still kind of gobsmacked by the whole thing, frankly. Mm -hmm. Dinah, was it a hope or a goal of yours at the outset of, of writing the Outlander series to have it become something filmed? No, never. Yeah, for one thing, I was aware that uh, any, I've read you know, books and I've seen the movies and I was aware that frequently the movie has very little <laughs> resemblance to the original book. And even when it does, it, uh, because of space constraints, you're only going to get you know, a very small portion of the book in the movie. In fact, uh, by and large, well, you've, probably most of you have seen one of my books. Uh, they can't get more than 10% of a book into an entire season. Wow. <laughs> so, you know, think about how much you're missing when you watch the show. <laughs> they are so very anyway, big books. <laughs> yeah, I did not uh, figure anybody would ever want to make a movie out of it, and I wasn't sure that I wanted them to <laughs> if they did. <laughs> well, yeah, so um, what I'm hearing you say is that TV probably, even though it's not perfect because of the limitations, even with a long series, mm -hmm. it's way preferable to a feature film adaptation. Yes, of exactly so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow. you can get much more into it. Yeah. And it lasts longer as well. And, you know, as my agent put it to me, he said, you know, you can't get better advertising for your books. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. What, and was it similar for you, or was, was television the only kind of genre or medium that came calling? But when you think back to it now, are you kind of grateful that it's television as opposed oh. to film? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, my books aren't nearly as long and I think as involved as Diana's, but you get, you know, we have eight hours instead of two and a half to try to get the entire mm -hmm. uh, story in. Mm. Mm -hmm. I hear what you're saying that uh, adaptations of books like yours 
are few and far between. But I'd be curious to hear from both of you whether before you embarked on these television projects, both of you, were there adaptations, literary adaptations, whether film or TV, that you had seen that you felt kind of got it right and you thought to yourself, wouldn't it be great if mine could be as good as mm -hmm. this? What would some of those be? Oh, hers. <laughs> <laughs> I thought the Outlander adaptation was amazing. You know, I, I've read the books and you I did a good job, yeah. I was so impressed. Um, yeah, well, for me, it would have been Last of the Mohicans. Mm -hmm. I thought that was a fabulous movie, and, you know, uh, if anything, slightly improved the book. <laughs> wow, how interesting. <laughs> you know, it's, it, I'd be curious to know, well, you're talking about the, the book being optioned five times before it actually, mm -hmm. you know, became something. And then in your case, Shonda, how were you both able to feel like the person involved, the producer involved, the optioner, Mm -hmm. was someone you could trust? Was it past work that you had seen that person do? Was it a specific conversation that you had, starting with, with Shonda, for instance? Um, well, the first thing was that, you know, past work, I mean, she's, she's not Shonda Rhyme, she's amazing. Um, mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. people for a while were saying, oh, she's the most, you know, powerful female showrunner in Hollywood, and then people were like, no, no, she's the most powerful showrunner. Let's, let's, let's give right. her her due. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, she's just so incredibly smart, so just knows how to make television that people want to watch. And then also, at one point in the process, um, I had to do this incredible laundry list of all the characters mm. because I, I've created kind of this little world with lots of little Easter eggs for many of the readers where I'll bring in characters for other books. And so I had to go through and do this very detailed document saying, well, this, for example, the character of Lady Danbury, who's a big character in the show, she actually is first introduced in another book, which was not under the option. So, mm. you know, I had to come up with, you know, in, in my contract, it says something like, you know, should this other book get optioned, you must rename Lady Danbury and, you know, all this stuff. Um, so in the process of handing them this document, and then they came back with this whole list of the characters they wanted and all these things. And I realized somebody was really thinking about this. Somebody had already done a very deep dive into these eight books and, and had some thoughts about what they really wanted to do. And it wasn't the case of, this is interesting, let's just, let's grab it, let's pay the option, you know, we mm -hmm. can afford, you know, however much money, just hold on to it for a few years. So it was pretty clear that they cared about it. And I thought, okay, this is, this is, this is good. Mm. Mm -hmm. How about you, Diana? Uh, well, in the previous options, this all took, uh, most of those took uh, place before there was such a thing as uh, a mega series based on books. Basically, it was George R. R. Martin who made the world safe for Outlander <laughs> <laughs> by <laughs> proving that a gigantic series uh, based on uh, you know, large-ish books and so forth could be successful. And also, he was so successful that everybody suddenly wanted to find big fantasy books that they could base a series on it. And you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, prior to that, though, it was mostly people wanting to make a one-hour feature film of Outlander, which I could tell was never going to work. But as they gave me the odds, I said, okay, well, we'll, we'll, okay, we'll roll the dice here and see what happens. And uh, the nice thing about an option is that they pay you a certain amount of money. Well, that's yours. You get to keep it, whether they make the film or not. Right. So uh, and I knew that Anthony Burgess, for instance, lived off his option films for uh, his option fees for A Clockwork Orange for 35 years before they finally succeeded oh in God. making a movie of it. Yeah, I had a friend who gave me advice. He said, "Oh my gosh, every book I write gets optioned, and none of them get made." But mm -hmm. you know, she's going on vacation ought, yeah. every year on the money. So yeah, yeah. Wow. Hey. <laughs> so Diana, did you reach a point after option number four ran out? <laughs> that you thought, well, maybe I'll just keep optioning this. It won't actually ever get made, but uh, it'll just be option after option. Did you ever think it, did you ever hold out hope that it was still going to actually reach screens? I really didn't care one way or the other because uh, from what I could see, it was a total crapshoot whether it would be any good or not. You know, and if it happened, fine. If it, uh, if it was terrible, I would be upset, you know, but, uh, but you know, you, you kind of can't go looking for options unless you have that kind of agent and mine yeah. were strictly book agents. Wow. You wait and somebody comes along every so often and then you look at, at what they're proposing and you look at their record if they have one. Most of the people I was, uh, who made options for me were not you know, professionals or were very low on the rung. We got fairly close to having a uh, four evening mini series with ABC, as in the, the proposal got as high as their uh, director of programming. Uh, and what happened then was 9-11. 
after which the whole entertainment industry was completely flattened and all of the networks immediately dumped everything that they had in development and started over. So that was the end of that one and a good thing because it was a horrible script. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can only imagine like what kind of red flags might pop up in, in cases like this where you've teamed up with someone or you maybe mm -hmm. you're just having a, a first conversation with someone and you hear them say something or have an idea that you feel is just completely wrong. <laughs> and how do you get to a point where mm -hmm. you feel like, oh no, I have to defend mm -hmm. my work and my name and the name of the franchise? Was that a tough place to get to or did you always feel like, no, I'm good at sticking up for myself? Yeah, well, uh, the latter, basically. <laughs> but uh, fortunately, you know, when the final option with uh, Ron Moore and so forth came through, it was Sony behind it. Okay, these are not fly-by-night people. <laughs> you know, they're not also not people that I want to go up against legally. Uh -huh. um, and uh, Stars then was the distributor and so forth, also a fairly high-powered thing. But uh, after the option was signed and so forth, uh, Ron and his business partner, Merrill Davis, both came out to my house and spent two days with me talking through what they thought about the script and how they wanted things to go. And uh, Ron was telling me, he said, you know, uh, I love Outlander, it's wonderful, but this beginning is rather slow and you can't do that in a series where you're mm. trying to hook people in. So he said, what I'd like to do is a little prologue that just highlights Claire and exactly who she is. So I'd like to do something that's like a flashback to her in World War II. We have her in the middle of blood and violence and saving lives and all that, just a little two minute thing. And I'm going, yeah, 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 <laughs> sounds good. Yeah. So we were kind of on the same wavelength and you know, we've continued to get along very well together. I love that because you know, in my experience in covering the film industry, sometimes you hear about films where the script is bought mm -hmm. and the writer is never welcome on the set, never seen or heard from again, it's the credit and that's it. Of course, there's the opposite example where the writer is given lots of opportunity to give input, but it's, it sounds like it was important to you to have a company and executives who fully appreciated your yeah. input and we're Well, it was, and that's hard to guarantee. Right. But when they were negotiating the contract, my uh, agent uh, said, I'm writing in something to make you a consultant on the show. And I said, okay, uh, what do I have to do? And he said, well, probably nothing. <laughs> Normally when they hire you as a consultant, they want you to stay out of their way <laughs> and just take the checks. They said, on the other hand, you know, if you're friendly with them and you get along with them, they may want to actually ask your advice once in a while. I said, I will be friendly to them, <laughs> that's <laughs> basically. So great. And uh, that's worked out. But the other thing thing was uh, that the reason that Sony was willing to spend that much money for a large thing was because it was a big book-based series with a huge fan base. Okay, and the last thing they want is for the author and proprietor of this huge fan base to get on her enormous Facebook site and say, this is terrible, they're ruining my story. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so they, they had a vested interest in being on my side, you might say. Julia, did you have any interest in the inner workings of the television business before Shonda Rhimes contacted you? Was it something you were intrigued by? Um, well, I grew up very, kind of on the very, very outskirts of it anyway. Um, my cousin was uh, on the Waltons growing up, which was kind of fun. She played the littlest Walton, um, which doesn't actually impress my kids that much because none of them have seen it, but people my age are very right, impressed. That's big. I was the only kid in first grade to have her cousin on her lunchbox. Uh. It was <laughs> incredibly cool. Um, so I, I got to go visit the set and stuff when I was growing up, and so I, I knew a bit about it, but um, not really, I think. You know, on, on the flip side, I also had people in my family who had, you know, tried to get into screenwriting and, you know, gotten royally screwed by Hollywood and stuff, so I, I did not have big, mm. you know, rose-colored glasses about the whole thing. But, um, you know, I, I thought it might be really intriguing to, you know, like, ooh, it could be kind of cool to be in the writer's room. But then I thought, I think my presence would actually be very disruptive when you have people talking about how to, you know, because it's very, most of Shonda's shows have a, um, a large group of writers working together to figure everything out. And I thought, you know, to have the author of the source material there would be, I think, very disruptive. I think it'd be very difficult for people to be honest and open about what they think will work in television and, and, and saying like, oh, this, this part isn't gonna work. It's not an insult on me or my book. It's just, you know, there are lots of parts of books that aren't gonna translate that well to shows. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I, th I thought it was kind of intriguing. And then um, there's actually a spinoff of Bridgerton coming later this year, which is a prequel about Queen Charlotte, who mm -hmm. was played by Golda Rocheville, who's just amazing. 
And um, I did kind of inquire at the beginning of that saying, oh, you know, maybe I could be in the writer's room on that one mm -hmm. and get involved because it's not based on my source material. She's actually the only main character in Bridgerton who wasn't in the books. <laughs> and she's the one who's getting <laughs> the uh. spinoff. I think it's great because I, I love her. Um, but it turned out in the end that Shonda was decided to write those scripts herself. So oh, wow. there isn't a writer's room. It's just Shonda. So I was like, mm -hmm. I don't have that one. But in, in a twist, um, I wrote the novel based on her sh scripts. <laughs> and I have to point out my husband was over there. It, it was his idea. Um, there is, he's nodding. Yes, my husband came in and he said, you should write the script. So, so it, it, it's kind of, uh, my favorite quote was, and I can't remember who said it, it was like in the, I think it was in New York Magazine, they said something like, in the category of we have more material than we know what to do with. <laughs> um, it's, you know, so now you have these books that created a show, that created another show, that created a book. So we kind of went all the way around and that, so the book will be coming out right around the same time as the show and that was a really fascinating process taking scripts and you really have to break down the architecture mm. and then build it back up because the scripts are many, many small scenes and that's mm. not gonna work for yeah. a, 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 um, a novel. Um, and so I had, you know, and I had to figure out, okay, well, whose point of view is it going to be? And it was very much like a big puzzle trying to figure out how to do this. And, you know, what am I pulling from the scripts and what am I adding in? Because suddenly now you're going to get into the characters' heads in a way you don't get into in the show. Mm. Um, so that's been a really fun project. I love that. That's crazy turnabout. <laughs> yeah. Um, for both of you, you've had lead cast members that have just become, you know, so wildly popular on Outlander, Sam Hewen, Katrina Balfe. Rega, John Page, Phoebe, all of the, these people who have just benefited so much and brought these characters to life in a way that has really captured the imagination of the audience. Mm -hmm. Diana, how involved, if at all, were you allowed to be in the casting process? Were you able to say, this guy feels, this guy feels right, she feels right? And when you watched early episodes, did you have a sense of which people were going to take off? Uh, no, to both those things. <laughs> They're not about to let a, an author pick yeah, the no. cast. <laughs> uh, they, we would probably pick the wrong people. We know nothing about casting, or at least I know nothing about casting. Yeah. And also, it just doesn't work that way. But uh, they were worried about finding Jamie because, as they say, he's such an iconic character and all that. And so they said, you know, probably take us months and months to find him. But, but we think Katrina will be, or we think that uh, Claire will be easy because there's tons of, you know, good British actresses who are about the right age and size and all that sort of stuff. And so everyone was expecting to find Clara right away and have a terrible search for Jamie. And as Meryl told me, she was sure that it would go up to the very last minute and then turn out to be the UPS man. Yeah. But <laughs> instead, you know, they had just barely begun casting. I got a phone call the next day that said, we found Jamie. And I said, what? <laughs> I don't believe it. Who? And they told me his name. And I said, okay, uh, what does he look like? <laughs> or, you know, more or less. Actually, I said, what color is his hair? Because you know, it was important that Jamie have red hair. And I was thinking, you know, if he's very swarthy looking, that's not going to look good, you know, with, with, with the red hair and all that. And uh, they said, well, his hair is dyed black at the moment, but I think it's naturally blonde. And I said, okay, his skin tone will be fine for being a redhead. And it was, and so forth. Anyway, they said, we're uh, emailing you his audition. And uh, I was in a car on my way to Santa Fe at the time, so I was very excited. I said, great, cool. And uh, as we were driving, I was Googling on my phone, you know, this is a number of years ago, so primitive phone, etc. But um, Sam did not have a, a huge film filmography, as they say. He'd been in uh, several plays as a younger man, and he'd been in like an episode of this and a half a season of that on British television, but very little. Mm. And he was uh, usually had his hair, you know, blonde but worn in kind of a beetle shag or something, which is not how his hair normally grows. It, uh, I told him you have the most exuberant hair I've ever seen. It <laughs> normally grows straight up, and it's very curly <laughs> in its natural state. <laughs> but anyway, so I was looking at uh, some of the still shots from his early stuff, and I was thinking. What are you thinking? You know, to the casting people, <laughs> really? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so anyway, I sat down and not sure what I was going to see, but uh, came up and I was saying, well, he looks all right, you know, aside from the black hair. Anyway, he he started, you know, playing the first scene and he was gone and it was just Jamie right there and I was going, I was never so shocked in my life. I hadn't expected that at all. But you know, he just had it from the very beginning, wow. and yeah, you know, we got to be quite good friends later. And I said, how did you? Uh, what did you do before the yeah. audition? And he said, I read the book. <laughs> he said, I, I just have a gut feel for the guy. <laughs> and he does. <laughs> and then are you now telling me that 
finding Katrina took longer than they expected? Oh yes, much, much longer. That one went right down to the wire because they looked at all kinds of actresses and they just didn't have what Claire has. And finally they got within a week of the shooting date and when production happens, it happens. You can't push it back because you have a crew of 250 people suddenly on salary as of that date. And so they're gonna have to have a Claire regardless. And so the Sony and Stars execs uh, got together and uh, went through all of the audition tapes that they had. They called it down to a box full and gave one to every person with any kind of interest in it and said, go through this and you know pick one. <laughs> and so they did and they all came back red-eyed from watching me movies all weekend and every single person said well I don't know what it is but there's just kind of there's something about this one and they had all picked Katrina on the basis of her one-line audition which was help stop he's going over <laughs> 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 Wow that's wild that yeah. everyone felt the same yeah. way. Yeah, they that did. Shows that it's yeah, right. It was right, and uh, so they called Katrina and <laughs> said, "You have to be in Glasgow in three days." <laughs> so she had to run right out and rent a storage unit, throw everything she owned into it, and fly to Glasgow basically in what she was wearing. <laughs> That's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. What's your what was your recollection, Julia, of the, uh, the casting process, and what did they tell you what was going on? I knew nothing at all. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was even less involved than that. Um, the first person I actually did hear about that was Julie Andrews. And um, I stopped breathing for long enough that I legitimately should be dead. Um, <laughs> that I certainly, I don't know what I thought they were going to do with Lady Whistledown, but I never in, in a million years dreamed that it would be Julie Andrews. And lest anybody think that her voice is not super important, let me tell you, I've seen rough cuts of the show. <laughs> where they've got someone else reading her lines because she hasn't recorded them yet. And there's some where it's just somebody reading and they're not necessarily trying that hard. But there are some where they clearly have somebody who is trying hard. And oh my gosh, they're just not Julie Andrews. It's, it, it's unbelievable what her voice does to the show. And so that, that was incredible. They, um, I mean, I couldn't speak, I, I couldn't believe that. And then a few days later they sent me information about all the, the, the cast, they had done about half the cast at that point that they were gonna release. And um, you know, none of the actors really were super well known at that point. Um, they all had done some stuff, but they, you know, they didn't cast any big names at the time. And you know, so of course, I, like Diana, I'm like frantically googling everyone, like, what have they done? What have they, could I see? And see, you know, and <laughs> you just gotta trust them. And what I've learned is that I could never be a casting director. I mean, because I see these people and they're absolutely perfect, and yet I, I don't know, I, I, I don't think I would have picked them, or I wouldn't even know how to pick them. I'm not, I'm not a very visual person, so. It's like walking into a house and some people can just see the potential of it. Like if mm -hmm. we move this wall and change the orientation of yeah, the Yeah, I can't do that either. Right, so. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny to hear you say you're not a visual person. I mean, both of you, obviously what makes the book so interesting is the descriptions, right? And it's how you bring these worlds to life, how we bring these people to life. And yet it must be so mind bending to then see it, not in your mind's eye, but in 3D with all of the cinematography and the lighting and the costumes and the production design. Has there been something, Diana, start with you, where you saw something brought to life that originated from your mm -hmm. fingertips and it particularly impressed you? Ah. Uh, well, yes, but not in the way you mean. Uh, <laughs> when I first visited the set and so forth, uh, Ron took me into the, uh, the, the main set, which is the Great Hall at Castle Leoc, which is fantastic, you know, just a wonderful thing, and built on a soundstage, I was amazed. So we anyway, walked in, and I was going, ah, oh. <laughs> terribly impressed. Anyway, he said, so, is this like you imagined it? And I said, no, not at all, but it's great. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Julia? I think the thing that, for me, was the craziest when I got to the set um, was just the sheer scale of it. The, the fact that you're looking around going like, there are hundreds and hundreds of people working on this. And they're all very, very busy. Mm -hmm. And they all seem to be very good at their jobs. And I don't understand what half of them are doing. But to <laughs> me, that was the most mind blowing thing. It wasn't, people kept asking like, is it so crazy to see like this person as your character, your story coming to like life? And it, it is, but I, I think it was just the scope of it that was incredible. Like, I think, uh, Adjoa Ando, who plays Lady Danbury, joked to me, goes, thank you for the employment. And, um, and I was like, well, I think you should thank Shonda. And he said, no, no, it all started with you. Uh, and, but still, just the, just the number of people involved. And then there are all the people I, you don't even see who are you know, in, in post 
and, and, and pre and stuff like that, um, post-production, sorry. Um, that to me was the craziest, just, just how, how big it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'd be curious to know from both of you, before each of the series premiered, how closely did you think you were going to be watching each episode? Did you think you were going to be watching each episode? How closely do you, did you think you would be watching it? And how closely do you watch every episode? I mean, for you, it's been three seasons. Well, the third Two. season. The third season. We're filming is, the third right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Six. Yeah, uh, we're filming the end of season seven right now. Right. So how? So what did you think you were going to do, and what do you do as far as watching it and watching it closely? I don't know. Um, well, I mean, you have to understand when I do watch it, I've already read the scripts. Right. So I, I already have a sense of what's going to be happening. I already know what has changed from the books. I already know what is kept from the books. Um, so I think, I think when I watch it, I have the scripts in mind more than the books, actually. Interesting. Um, because, and, and because uh, frankly, if they're fresher in my mind, I'm not somebody who rereads my own work very much. Um, unless I kind of have to for some reason, because, you know, and I have people like I have people who work with me who say, don't say this, but uh, I'm going to say anyway. So I, but by the time you finish a novel, you've read it so many times um, that, frankly, you know, by the end, you're like, this is so boring. <laughs> Um, you say, you know, this is, or just like, this is so predictable. Well, of course it's predictable if you've read it a hundred times, you know, because you know every word, but you have to because, you know, it just, that's part of the process. And so by the time the book comes out, I'm like, I don't, I don't want to see that again. I, I've been in it for so long. Um, it, you know, it may be different for you since you're working with the same characters more that you have to go back and, and research your own stuff more. But, um, so for me, the scripts are actually much fresher in my brain than the actual book. And you know, it, it was a very funny experience recently because I, I've been reading the scripts for season three, and you know, there's some lines in there, and I, I feel like that season three is pulling more lines from the actual book than season two did. And I'm being like, did I write that? I'm like, I think I'm gonna written that. So I did actually go because okay, I wrote the book 20 years ago. So I, you know, I went back and I pulled up my, you know file where I could do a search and I call it search and destroy. It's actually, you know, <laughs> copy, find, whatever. Uh -huh. And uh, I was like, I did write that. I said, like, that's a good line. You know, I was so excited. <laughs> uh -huh. um, so yeah, I, I, I'm not sure I quite answered your question, you did. but uh, all right. Good. Yeah. <laughs> what, what about you, Diana? Do you watch every episode super closely? Uh, well, yes, uh, they did make me a consultant and, uh, and we got along well. And they asked me, do you want to see scripts and things? I said, I want to see everything. And they show me everything. I get to see the scripts. I get to see the eight iterations of each script that it goes through before they are shooting and the two or three after they start shooting. And I see the daily footage that they shoot. Oh, I don't want to see in. the daily. Wow. Oh, the dailies are totally cool. Yeah, so, uh, you know, five days a week, they send me two or three files of, of the daily footage that they shot the day before. So I get to see multiple takes of this, that, and the other. And you know, some of them are you know, mildly interesting. I go through them. Others are just riveting, and I watch them over and over. <laughs> you know, uh, So I see them all. And then they start showing me the episodes as they're edited and assembled. And so I will see the studio network version, which is the rough cut. And then I will see the network version. And then I will see the studio version. And then I will see the first locked cut. I mean, theoretically, the locked cut is permanent, that's why they call it locked, but in practice I have actually seen as many as four locked cuts of the wow. same episode, so they'll change it for a good reason. <laughs> and uh, so I, I see all of the episodes in great detail <laughs> many times. I don't know if I'm <laughs> jealous or that much it, it would make my head explode. It, right. Yeah, I don't know. Well, you know, it's discretionary. They don't make me watch it. Right. Well, no, but still, yeah. I, but aren't you, uh, Diane, are you ever like, I just don't have time. I'm right. I'm working on something else. I don't have once time. Once in a while, yeah. But the nice thing about this is it's, it's in my email. I can go back and look at it, you know, tomorrow. I don't have to watch it the same day it was shot. So, you know, sometimes I'll have a free evening and I'll watch two or three days worth of dailies. Sometimes. Uh -huh. Excuse me. I'll have a look at it, and uh, I know that how this scene works. And either I don't like it for some reason, or it's just not that interesting. And so I'll just watch one or two takes and say, "Okay, that's enough." <laughs> oh. I would love to know from both of you. Okay, so the first Bridgerton novel was two was 2000. The show premiered in 2020. First Outlander novel, 1991. The show premiered in 2014. So 20 mm -hmm. years later, 23 years later, what? How did you notice that things had changed? And what changed when the shows premiered 
and, mm. be, and took off. What did you notice happening different? Did you obviously oh. increase sales of the books, but what else did you notice like, whoa, we're in a different world here? <laughs> Uh, when I got spoofed on Saturday Night Live, <laughs> you know, that, that was big. Um, Who played you? I mean, it wasn't me, but the oh, show. Oh, the show. Okay, the show. that's interesting. Well, I'm counting that as, as, as me. That yeah. counts. Mm -hmm. um, you yeah, know, they're by. Bridgerton <laughs> jokes in New Yorker cartoons. Mm -hmm. You know, they're mm -hmm. making jokes about it in all of the late night TV hosts. Mm -hmm. um, and then I have Bridgerton lipstick. I have Bridgerton shoes. I drink Bridgerton <laughs> tea. There's a Bridgerton clue in Monopoly game. I mean, that just blows my mind. And so every you know, every time there's a new crazy thing, I just like, are you what? How is this my life? Oh, the funniest one was the NFL did a spoof of Bridgerton, except it was for the draft. And I know very little about pro football, but I, I do know what the draft is. And so, um, you know, they sort of had somebody being lady whistle blown, I think, instead of whistle down. <laughs> and she narrated it, um, talking about all the guys going through the draft. And, you know, they, they managed to get pictures of them in their flashy, some of them were very flashy outfits, their flashiest outfits talking about the draft. I mean, and that was, I remember thinking like, I, I, I never thought I'd be culturally relevant to the NFL. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and that, that, was, that was one that, you know, I remember I called up my dad, um, and I was like, Dad, you will never believe this one. And he was just, you know, that was really fun. And he was just like. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. How about you, Diana? What did you notice that changed? Oh, uh, well, the first thing was a New York City bus with a huge Outlander ad covering yeah. the entire bus with, you know, the Highlands and Sam and Katrina in costume on it and so forth. And after that, you know, it was, it was things yeah. like that. We have uh, got mentioned in uh, Orange is the New Black and South Park and, you know, a <laughs> number South of places. Park. Yeah. <laughs> Have you heard about people that you admire in any field who are fans of your books and or the TV shows that they've spawned? Mm -hmm. Like who? Yeah, uh, my very first fan letter was from, uh, it was uh, one of Richard Nixon's daughters who then married the son of, of uh, President Eisenhower. Okay. I can't remember her name, but, <laughs> but it was Julie a very Nixon nice fan letter. Julie Nixon Eisenhower, that was her. That was my first, you know, recognizable fan. But after that, it kind of increased, <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of a thrill when you see an email from, you know, somebody who you don't know, but you know them. Right. That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Anyone? Apparently, Dionne Warwick tweeted that she was very disappointed that reggae wasn't coming back. Oh. Um, so, you know, or then, um, you know, that the Kardashians were tweeting about it or Instagramming about it. So, you know, just, it, it's, it, yeah, it's crazy. And then I think, I think there's something where uh, Dr. Jill Biden had watched it, and I was like, oh my gosh, the first lady <laughs> has watched the show. I don't know if she's read the books, but, you know, I mean, that's the thing is that usually it's people talking about the show, not the book so much. But I'm, I'm totally okay with that. Right, better than, better than yeah. nothing. Mm -hmm. Okay, you've both spent time on the set. Mm -hmm. Diana, you did a cameo? I did in the first season. Yeah, they asked me to. <laughs> and how did, what was that whole process like? <laughs> oh, that was a lot of fun. They, uh, they made me a special costume, and they took great care over it. They were very proud of it, and sort of fa fantastic costume and so forth. But it was totally authentic, you know, down to the corset and the <laughs> stockings and all that sort of stuff. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, and I got my own trailer, <laughs> which was a lot of fun. How many lines did you have? Uh, just one. Um, <laughs> what was it? Oh, uh, well, let's see. It's a scene that takes place in the Great Hall at Castle Leoc during the gathering. So there's a lot of people in costume and so forth. I am up in the gallery along one side. And while I'm up there, um, Claire and Murtaugh come rushing past me down to the end and so forth. And uh, I'm turned toward the stairway where they uh, have just come through. And up comes Mrs. Fitzgibbons, you know, the Chatelaine of the castle, and, and emerges in her finery and so forth. And uh, I see her coming and say, Glenna. And uh, she says, oh, Leona. And, uh, and she comes toward me. I turn and survey this. And uh, I'm dressed in my best and obviously married to a rich merchant or something. I say, I see you have the castle looking bright as a new pin. <laughs> I spent half an hour with the dialect coach. Oh, wow. Yeah. wow. <laughs> I said it to my Scottish son-in-law, and he said, that's actually good. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, to which she replies as she sweeps past me, what a beautiful gown. You wore it so well at the last gathering. <laughs> and there must have been eagle-eyed fans who, were, who completely spotted you. Oh, I was one of them. Oh, yeah. Who oh, yeah. spotted I, you. Right? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I knew about that. We were all like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Has there been a Julia Quinn 
cameo in Bridgerton? Not yet, no. Mm. Have uh, you asked for one? Well, you know, I, I thought about it at first, but you know, my time on the set was so limited. It could, you know, it's such a long. They do all the filming in the UK, and I live in Seattle, and it's mm -hmm. it's quite a hike. And uh, and then I barely got to during season two. I only got to visit for one day because of COVID. Mm. Um, and I just wanted to see everything. I mean, to actually be an extra, or they call it an SA now, yeah. whatever. Um, supporting artist. Supporting artist, thank yeah. you. Um, it takes a lot of time. I mean, because, so it, you know, usually they spend a whole day figuring out what your look is mm -hmm. and they get you all ready the one day and then like the next day you come back and they have to get you in the costume, all that stuff. And I just, I wanted to be able to see everything. Mm -hmm. um, so, so maybe in the future. Mm -hmm. For each of you, what, what's on your goal list? right now uh, you know you've, you've had this tremendous success with these series with the television adaptations what's kind of next to, to tick off on the on the goal list well um if i were not here talking to you i would be home writing book 10 of, this, so. of the series which i think will be the last one but then again i thought outlander was the only book I was ever going to write. And you know, things happen, so you can't tell. Um, I often write more than one thing at a time. Uh, people complain because the last book, Go Tell the Bees That I Am Gone, took seven years to wow. come out. And I said, yes, that would be ex excessive, save that I wrote four other books during that seven years. <laughs> so I was actually doing well. Um, so at the moment, I'm only writing two books at once. Uh, there's book 10, and then there is the prequel, dealing with Jamie and, uh, it, well, Jamie's parents, not yet with Jamie. And and uh, that they, we have also been greenlit, not only for a season eight of Outlander, but also for a prequel uh, show mm. starring uh, Brian and Ellen. And uh, I am writing the book right now that that will be based on. <laughs> so we're kind of talking back. But you're and writing forth. the book first, and then they're going to adapt it? Well, kind of at the same time. Okay, I was going to say, so backwards of what I did with the free. Yeah, no, this is going to be interesting, you know. Yeah. But, but we talked it over, and, uh, you know, I've been working with these people for a long time. Yeah. We kind of trust each other. We get along. So, you know, I told them what I knew and what I was planning to do and so forth, and they sent me their pilot script, which I read. And, you know, overall, I, I was okay with it. You know, I had a quibble about this one thing and explained to them why. And then there are a couple of things that they had told me they were going to do or wanted to do, and those are things that I have no interest in writing myself. So, you know, so those will be in that show and not in the book. <laughs> but there will be other things in the book that aren't in the show because there always are. <laughs> How about you? I am not sure. I mean, so I just finished up this, the project that I told you about of adapting these scripts into a novel. And that was, I think, mm -hmm. crazy and different enough for me that <laughs> I thought, you know, mm -hmm. we'll see what's next. You know, but I, I really like this idea of doing something a little different and exercising a different part of the writing brain. Um, like I, I haven't had an original novel out in a while, but I did have, for example, a graphic novel come out. Okay. Um, so I have been kind of, you know, trying a few different things. And the graphic novel is still in the Bridgerton world. It's actually based on a ridiculous gothic novel that the characters read and usually make fun of. And I'd had readers asking me to write the whole novel. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I kept saying, no, no, that would be terrible because part of the fun of it is it's very poorly written. Uh -huh. And so I get to write these paragraphs of really, really bad writing and put it into my novels, uh, which is really fun for a paragraph, but I'm not gonna release an entire novel of this. Mm -hmm. And then I realized that it would actually make a really great graphic novel, and my sister was a cartoonist, and so my sister illustrated it. Um, and unfortunately, she uh, was killed in, by a drunk driver um, before it could come out, which is mm -hmm. it's really quite devastating. Oh, yeah. um, mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. in the end, it turned out to be this really great blessing because I have you know, just the essence of her in her drawings and in this art. And, you know, it took a while to get to the point where I could, you know, talk to you all about this, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, without bursting into tears. But um, mm. it's really an incredible, wonderful piece of her that I now have in this. Yes. In this and you'll keep it alive and you'll keep her alive. Yeah. Alive, which I think yeah. Is and it's, I mean, she had the most ridiculous sense of humor and the book is just ridiculous and over the top. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, they're, you know, talking pigeons and you know, so yeah, it's just mm -hmm. people from New York say it's very triggering with these demonic pigeons, but um, <laughs> yeah, but it, it was a lot of fun. So who knows? I'm not, not really sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you for mm -hmm. telling us mm -hmm. about that. Um, mm -hmm. I, with the, the just two minutes that we have left, I'd be curious to know what each of you is watching or reading right now, if you have time to watch and read anything that's not your own work that you're <laughs> excited about that you would want the audience to know about. 
well, right now I want to watch Bridgerton. <laughs> 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 you know, normally I don't have time to watch recreational yes. TV at all because of you know dailies and things like that and, and writing. I work at night and there's a limited number of, of dark hours mm -hmm. for me and so forth. But yeah, that's definitely high on my list. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm at least one season behind on, on Outlander, but I, I am fairly caught up. Um, I've actually <laughs> been reading a lot lately because I'm, I'm supposed to go on the Today Show soon as they're not not for my stuff, but to actually recommend books they have authors on to do like the yes. book roundup. And so, um, but what they don't tell you is that they kind of say, well, we want all the books to be new and upcoming. So then suddenly I have to source all these books uh. because you can't just pick a book you read last year that you loved. You uh. actually have to... So I have to find books that haven't come out yet and, and ask for them. And then, um, but I have found some really great ones. Um, there's one I really liked, which I'm, hopefully I'll be talking about on the show, called oh boy, Now You See Us, which is set in Singapore. Um, and the, the main characters are these Filipina maids. And mm -hmm. you just get the, and there's also a murder mystery. And, and so it's, uh -huh. parts of it are very funny. And parts of it are also kind of this very searing um, political or socio, just kind of critique of society there and, and, and the mm -hmm. striation of it. So that was really good. I enjoyed that. And um, I'm blanking on I think we're, I think I'm watching White Lotus season two right now. Great I mean, choice. Like everyone else. I'm liking it more than season one, actually, I think. Okay. Mm -hmm. You haven't gotten to the end yet? No. Oh, you're in for a treat. Okay. <laughs> Nobody okay. tell no me. No spoilers. This is a spoiler-free room. But um. It's a great White Lotus season <laughs> two. Pretty great. Uh-huh. Good. Mm -hmm. What a pleasure it is to meet and talk to the both of you, Diana Gobbledon, <laughs> Julia Quinn. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you and so thank much. you to the Rancho Mirage Writers Festival for having us. <laughs>